Okay, so I think it is time to get started. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to this fourth and last day of the GNU Tools track at the Linux Plumbers Conference. I will be the moderator for the first half of today's session, and the session will start off right away with a both on the topic OpenMP, OpenACC, and offloading, uh, led by Tobias Bernus and Jakub Jelinek. So, how would you mean? Let's get started. Okay, well, so hello from me. And well, it's a buff. So, the idea is, of course, to have some discussions. So, if it fits, then simply interrupt and do it. What is well, essentially topics wise, open piece, I think, one of the big topic. Today, there's um, OpenMP 4.5, which is essentially now supported. And the big, now also for Fortran, essentially the big step is, of course, between 4.5 and 5.0. 5.1 is also coming. And as you can see, a huge number of pages were added, and of course, a lot of features. So there are a lot of gaps which need to be filled, but in principle also with OpenACC. Them now support in GCC 10, but there are some bugs and minor features. And in principle, there's also 4.7 and 3.0, one should add features. So that's on one side of the Pragma language features, of course, offloading, we talk about it. Well, on phi in principle we have HSA intermediate language is now about to remove or was removed. We have NVIDIA PTX MG GCN, which of course also has to be extended and has items to do. And in principle, we can talk also about other offloading and concurrencies um, if someone has a lot of interest in it, otherwise. I would stick to the topics mentioned before. So in terms of OpenMP, now comes a lot of slides with a bunch of missing features, especially for offloading, mapping changes, C++, this pointer. Quartron locator components where it really then goes all the high tree through, also polymorphic components, array shaping, declare mappers, Unified shell memory and allocation clauses and, yeah. and support also of allocators of high bandwidth on the shared memory or on the host or thread polarization side, offloading, nested loops, meter directive, clear bounds, and then also on the tooling side for debugging which at some point. I can go over those items and then go back to discuss a bit. Um, then, of course, our newer features like detached clause, we still need to implement LVL version as you can see more API, more environment variables, and also on the threat side. Numatic topology, host teams. So a huge number of features before coming back to them. And on the other side, of course, performance issues also exist. Like we need to, I mean, currently the, um, after some initial optimization, the, um, especially of offloading, uh, Functions are split off and arguments pass around. And then the, it breaks with optimization since things like having a constant there is no longer propagated into the offloading functions or checks that something is not used or both ways not being read in or not being modified is not taken into account. So there are a lot of items to be done on that side. And 
actually the basic things that also generally floating, I think. Um, you need or there are some issue if one has software distribution, wants to do it, and then there was the issue if there is. I mean, currently it's supported to have different offloading in the binary. So for NVIDIA, for AMD, and the host variant, and then if one starts it, it can choose either of them. But if one has like for GCN, different architectures where it's incompatible, then who has only the chance to have one. That's something I think we need to be taken into account. And then in total, also we need to make sure that we don't lack spend too much behind the changes and, and for the NVIDIA platform and also for GCN. I think there are a lot of people want to have commodity platforms. So that's kind of things I want to discuss yep. today, but that's kind of also the overview about all before diving into something. Uh, for the multiple uh... GCN uh, architectures. The, the thing uh, on, on the PTX side is, is that it's, it's backwards compatible. So we, although we can can be slower than, than we could if we supported the latest architecture, but the 3.0 three and 3.5 difference is not that big, I think. Uh, for, for the GCN, we, we really need different uh, different data or uh, different executables we, which we put into data section. So we need to have some support to invoke uh, the GCN compiler twice or multiple times and, and put the different alternatives into the binaries if the users choose so. No, for NVPTX, I recently came across some item where they say in the, I don't know whether it was S M80 or I think one swap or some some command was not available in your ones. So while well, they keep some backward compatibility, that seems to be that they wanted to start replacing some by deprecating them and then removing as far as uh, so, at least in terms of the hardware. So it might become an issue. Do I agree it currently it's more GCN? But uh, for for PTX because it's it's a text, maybe we should handle it by doing some kind of pre-processing on the on the on the text uh, by selecting by by emitting the code for both separated by by some markers and then then let the linker or where, where we actually put the put the PTX, uh, PTX IL into, into libcuda hands, we could just, just replace it or choose, choose one of the two variants. Compared to, to emitting almost the same code for both architectures. But for, for GCN, that's, I think, not, not possible. I'm not here there. I go page, maybe. Yeah. Don't be free stress word that it sounds possible invoking M key of float twice. And But we, we need some, some way how users can actually uh, request it or, or how, how can they configure the compiler to, to do it by default. So a way to ask for it in, for instance, in a float uh, argument. We have multiple, you mean? Yeah. 
for the optimizations, uh, we already have some magic attributes on the structures, and we can perhaps add more more magic attributes, which which can tell the IPA uh, optimizations that the argument is special and that it can be modified. And, we can remove structure elements from it uh, later on if we want to, and and so on. Uh, uh, as long as as we modify both the caller or and callie, or we can do some extra optimizations like like the constant propagation and, and so on. But yeah, it would it would mean writing special OpenMP or OpenACC related uh, IPA passes, or add uh, OpenMP knowledge to to the current ones. Yeah, always something can be done early before emitting, but a lot of things has to be done done later. Value propagation. Yeah, and and it is probably not not a good idea to move uh, the current OpenMP lowering and OpenMP expansion much later. Because yeah, I think it it would break too too much. Uh, so so for for some optimizations, of course, it's it's not not desirable to to have it so early. But for many things, uh, it's. It's the latest point where, where it can be done this way. Because when, when the optimizations change the co code too much, then, then we couldn't rely on various properties we need for OpenMP conformance in the IL. I think some cases like copying in or out uh, modification might be visible early. The phone could then change and I don't know, first private to private or whatever, but yeah. Well, I've, I've already done, done some optimizations like this, like turning shared into first private if, if if we can very early prove that the, the variable is, is just read and never written. But it has to be very conservative and, and it's before uh, before SSA. So so there are many, many cases where it, it needs to miss. Uh, yeah. The other optimization, I think, at uh, some point we should do some more better than one example. One has a constant value at the end, and then it get, does not get optimized inside. So we should something address there. Yes. Yeah, so, so either either extend the current interprocedural copy propagation to handle this case as well or have a separate it, it probably would be better to, to modify the constant propagator and also the interprocedural value propagation again something that will that could use this kind of knowledge about openmp that we store all the all the parameters or all the or the mapped or shared uh, or privatized uh, variables into into the same structure and then read it from there. So propagate the constants either into into the offloaded or uh, outline function or propagate there the value ranges and, and so on. Of the thing I also still have a bit to optimize the alias analysis. I think in many cases it works, but with passing them through the struct and then unpacking it, it sometimes does not recognize that it can do more. Yeah, that's true. Someone else, something to these topics? <laughs> Thank you.
Yes, I see just the discussion in the chat about your things are embedded. So, uh, for for the optimizations, the the problem I, I see is that there just isn't uh, enough time for those because the actual implementation of the new features it's so much time that there is not enough time not enough spare time for the optimizations uh, because for instance if i compare openmp 4.5 or 4.0 or the old releases it was enough in in one person or one and a half to do it in one year uh, either either just c and c plus plus or sometimes even c c, c plus plus and fortran and that's that seems completely impossible with 5.0. Uh, how long are we working on it now? It's two full years and, and something, and we are still not uh, not anywhere near complete. And 5.1 is, is around the corner. So I have the feeling that other compilers have a somewhat similar problem. Maybe they have yes, that's. I, I think I think no compiler has has complete 5.0 support right now. So it's kind of uh, the standard grows too much, and and I, I think one one of the things is is not just that the length of the standard, for instance, oh, and we talked about the number of pages, uh, the largest uh, amount of addition additional pages was from the OpenMP D and T. Those two take 180 pages uh, together. So that's most of the uh, most of the changes. But uh, during the implementation when uh, when different features need to uh, work together like there was an addition of last private conditional and it needs to be handled for cmd yet it needs to be handled for task loops and for all the other constructs and for for many of them it can't use the same code it has to behave differently and so uh, so it's not linear to the number of edit features uh, the implementation complexity uh, no problem i see if I so, um, things like this Fortran allocatable components that uh, sometimes they simply remove one line or so and then it gets very complicated here when I understand the problem that it gets in these derived types which can be deeply nested and they can be polymorphic so uh, one doesn't know a compile time what is there and can be extremely complicated and in principle I think the language also permits that the runtime type information is there and so on at least for Fortran I think for C they partially excluded it Start but for, 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 for instance for C++ I think one of the changes was that for references we need to map automatically also what the reference refers to and so that will be also quite quite huge change on the compiler side, but on the standard uh, side, it's it's one line. Uh, basically saying that reference works as, as if it was uh, the, the type, uh, the reference, uh, the re reference type. on terms of what currently on the works uh, was people have seen that at least I'm currently trying to bit finish the 4.5 stuff especially for Fortran that's a bit ongoing and well Jacob as well has seen this now working on no that's not the item uh, on the on loop work, I think regular loops. Okay, around. Uh, 
you probably see a bit more work on the mentor side as well. So I think the offloading is kind of the strong part. So there's some plans to get a bit, a bit more working in the in terms of mapping, like maybe the C++ this pointer, but C++ this pointer should be quite quick. I think that's that's a small change, but for for the mapping changes, there there are much larger changes. I think declare mapper is is one of the thing that that will need some work because the front ends needs to in some way stick into the IL. Uh, well, it needs to. Uh, uh, analyze which which variables will need to be mapped. Uh, right now, we we handle the mapping or only the the implicit mapping only only during the gamification. And for declare mapper, we will need to do it once again uh, in the front ends. And in that case, just just test whether whether the variable has has a type which has a declare mapper related to it and in that case look it up and create some some clauses that will then tell the gameplayfier what what how, how to map it and we'll probably need to throw away completely the implementation of the array sections in c and c plus plus because it needs to be probably rewritten so that it can handle arbitrary uh, L value expressions as basis of the of the array sections and also will handle the shaping. So, uh, so quick question for me is, uh, is uh, are there any um, parties working on OpenMP 5.0 besides Mentor and Red Hat? Uh, I think Suze is participating in the OpenMP meetings, but uh, and, and uh, Martin has been maintaining the HSAIL, but that's now uh, out of the tree. So okay. not sure. So not actually doing development work, but um, but participating in standards formation. Uh, Catherine, this is Jeff. Um, Thanks. I, I believe that IBM and uh, Intel also participate in the standards direction. Um, yeah. There is a sure. team yeah. talk to them, you know, doing GCC OpenMP work, but it has never panned out. Okay. Right now, I think it really is uh, Metro Graphics and, and Red Hat. Okay, thanks. Um, with IBM's Discarding of their research division and um, and um, acquisition of Red Hat um, has any uh, is, has there been any um, movement between um, IBM to like take the people that actually understand OpenMP and have worked on it in like their Spectrum libraries and and uh, redirect them to working on it for open compilers like. GCC at LLVM? Um, we've had some discussions around uh, areas for collaboration, Ben, which would include, you know, runtime or, or core compiler, but nothing that is, that's gone anywhere yet. We're not talking to the right people yet. Got it, okay. Um, Right now, there is a cooperation on the on the standards on the language committee side, and where we work together with with all the parties. But and for the GCC implementation, so you and Tobias are kind of working together to to figure out who's who's working on what aspect of the OpenMP five dot aspect, so there's no overlap. Uh, well, th there is so much work that that it's it's quite easy to coordinate <laughs> who will okay. work on what. But 
so far we kind of gra uh, outlined roughly who is working currently on what, but... Uh, uh, yeah, I, I am working on, on the non-rectangular loops right now and want to finish perhaps with, with the help from Honza uh, on the LTO side, the declare variant, which, which is mostly implemented, but the final bits, bits need to be done. Right. Then there is quite a lot of library side work uh, for instance, on the NUMA uh, discovery of, of the, uh, for, for the teams, host teams constructs, because right now we, we implement it just, just by always running it three times. Uh, so pretending there are three NUMA nodes. Yeah. Oh. That's, that's, <laughs> that's good for testing, but not, not for anything else. Okay, is, are you planning to, I, I saw that time is up, but I, I guess I'm just wondering if OMPT and OMPD are on your roadmap. They're not on ours. Uh, uh, well, uh, th there was a hope that OpenMPD would be done by, by the student uh, during GSOC, but it, it didn't work out. Uh, That's a pretty big job for during GSOC. So, so we have some preliminary patches from from the student. They could be well. The, the first few patches could be usable, but but the real work needs to be done. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, and my very quickly wrap up from my side of what I was doing. It's a bit Fortran part. The 4.5 wrap up and a bit of these which are already in C, C++ implemented and then someone is trying to get a C++ this mapping. That's essentially what's currently up on the mentor side. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so unfortunately our time is up. So if you would like to continue the discussion, I think we can move over to one of the hack rooms. Um, otherwise, thank you very much, uh, Jakob and Tobias, uh, for leaving us with Bob. And we will now have, uh, I guess, a three minute break uh, before we go on with our second off session on math libraries. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Patrick, are you on? Can we do a quick uh, audio and video check? Is the volume acceptable? Yes, audio is good. Good. And... All right. Okay, so the chats are up. You should have presenter status for flipping through them. Okay, I'll test that. Yes, seems to work. That's good. I was going to ask how to advance the slides, but I see the little prompt down at the bottom. This will be my first time presenting with this set of software tools. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm sure we have lots of here at this conference. Yeah, then I think we should be all be set. Let's just wait another two minutes until the half hour, and then we can get started. Yes.
Okay, I think it is now time to start our second session of the day, and this will be another buff session, this one on uh, LibM, LibGCC math functions, considerations for performance versus accuracy trade-offs, and it will be led through uh, by uh, Patrick McGarity. So Patrick, over to you. All right, uh, I think you all see the cover slide. Uh, a slight outline of what we're gonna be talking about. I'll start with a couple of examples to motivate uh, what has got me thinking about this topic. Uh, first, I'll present complex square root, where I've been working on uh, a major accuracy gain with a small loss of performance, and something that's already been accepted in glibc, a tiny loss of accuracy for a huge performance gain. And rather than get into the technical details of those two, the, I want to focus at least half this talk on identifying principles for deciding why we why we should be making these changes and what types of changes are appropriate. If there's time at the end, we could talk about other um, MathLib talk uh, topics. I say both uh, libgcc and libm because some functions are in one place and some are the other, but I think they're philosophically similar. So complex divide. Uh, that my proposed uh, accuracy improvement uh, has a major perform accuracy improvement with a clear loss of performance. It's not excessive, but it is measurable. Uh, the current methods um, based on Richard Smith's algorithm from 1962 gets massively wrong answers with when encountering very large or very small exponents. If you generate a, um, large set of fully random inputs over the full range, about 1.6% of the time, it's just wrong uh, on either the real or the imaginary portion of the result. Uh, so to get into some practical details, here's the a simplified version of the current code. I left out the cleanup code for handling infinities and not a number. Uh, so, uh, Complex divide involves a both a real and imaginary part. So for some um, result of E plus Fi, you have an input value of A plus Bi divided by C plus Di. And all the math is done, of course, with uh, just the real values A, B, C, and D. The current code looks for determining whether C or D is larger and then computes a ratio. Um, uh, so that the ratio of C and D or D and C is less than one. And then it does further computations using that ratio uh, to get the results. The problem comes when the ratio is a subnormal or zero due to underflow. That's the principal problem. There are others, but that's the biggest one. So. The, as, as listed now, I'm, here's a accuracy comparison of the current method, that would be A, with just testing the ratio for uh, underflow and using a different order of computation to avoid the underflow would be B. And then C is going further and scaling the input values as needed uh, where appropriate. And the top line, 8 ULP, 12 ULP, 16 ULP, and 14 ULP is kind of cryptic, but ULP, for those who aren't into math libraries, is units in the last place. So a 16 ULP is talking about the 16 low bits, and in this case of either the real or the imaginary portion. And in this table, it uh, refers to when either the real or imaginary portion is wrong in 16 or more places. Uh, and I use 16 as a, a nominal number that if you've, out of 50 something bits of the mantissa, if 16 bits are wrong, you're gonna cumulatively get wrong answers in further computations. It's just, that's a pretty massive error. Uh, and I put it all, I also added the 48, because if, you, if you're wrong in the first 48 bits of the mantissa, you really have very little accuracy 
in the final result. And we still have over 1% in the current code, over 1% are, have a completely wrong answer. Uh, so just testing the uh, ratio issue for subnormals gets us down to uh, two orders of magnitude improvement in reducing the number of wrong answers. If we further do a modest amount of scaling on the inputs when they are near the limits of, uh, of what's available, we get three orders of magnitude further improvement. These seem to be a, a fairly worthwhile uh, change to complex divide. At least I argue that we should be making those changes. Uh, but they do have a cost. Here's the performance chart to show us what the cost is. Everything's been scaled so that the current complex divide is one. Uh, values on that chart of less than one uh, shows a performance improvement. There's only one there, and I'm going to attribute that 1% variation to noise. Um, values greater than one show a slowdown. So now I, I also need to explain small and full. I have two data sets, each of 10 million values. The small set, uh, randomly generated but limited so the exponents are one half of the full range, so we don't run into any of these errors. And the full data set is um, the full range where we do run into the errors. So the small set shows us what the cost is for data that would not benefit from this change. Uh, and for x86, which has a pretty good branch predictor, so the test is almost free, uh, if we're just testing the ratio, we don't see uh, much change at all. And if we scale the inputs, uh, so that means three or four more branches that are, need to be checked, we see a modest 10% loss of performance. Uh, on ARM64, now these are both fairly, you know, three or four year old processors, so they're not the very latest branch predictors, and we might hope that future branch predictors would be better and, and reduce this cost. But with current hardware, uh, x86 uh, or ARM64 has even a single test cost us a bit more, and scaling the inputs is uh, a higher cost. If we look at the full range, the cost is more painful. For scaling everything, uh, getting best possible answers, we see a 36% overhead for x86 and a 75% overhead for ARM. I argue that that any amount of cost is justifiable for the full range because wrong answers at the 1% of the time level is just simply unacceptable and unusable. Um, so that gives us uh, a basis of, of setting the parameters of the discussion. And uh, I'll mention that Marketing benchmarkers tend to resist any performance reductions if they can get the single benchmark that they need to to brag about their hardware to get right answers, even if a realistic set of data wouldn't necessarily. There is also the option in GCC, even if we make these changes, to continue with the current behavior by using the, com the uh, compiler switch CX-limited range which says complex values are known to be within a limited range. So that allows users, aggressive users, to continue current behavior while letting people who aren't certain of their input ranges to get correct answers. That was uh, complex divide. Now for exponential, this one's already been accepted in glibc. Uh, in glibc 2.28, uh, Sadesh provided uh, a change to exponential, which gave us a large performance improvement with a tiny loss of accuracy. The case is when the true value was near half, halfway between two different uh, full 64-bit representations, the old method used software multi-precision to compute that final bit of rounding. The new method doesn't. It just rounds it to the best um, that normal arithmetic would, would generate. And only those cases are affected. In those cases, the maximum error is now as much as a fraction of a bit. And the performance so, gain is 10,000 times because software so is slow. 
I looked at this particular um, example in rather great detail and talked to um, talked to my customers about it. And um, uh, the thing that I even wrote a little program that actually uh, runs both math libraries against each other, and so it allows me to compare the percentage of correct values from um, like the Intel math library and old GC, glibc and new glibc or libm and um, and also whatever like CR lib um, um, m and stuff like that and um, what um, first of all um, what the the 10,000 times um, performance impact is horrible from the the perspective of HPC users because they have these jobs running in lockstep and whenever there's a notable variance between one node running a, a process and all the other nodes, uh, they fall out of lockstep and the overall efficiency goes greatly down. Now, whenever they, um, whenever I looked at Sadesh's code and compared it to um, Intel's, um, uh, Sadesh's code gets um, gets the answer right a lot more often um, than that. It was like I'd have to look at the numbers, but I think it was like two and a half times um, that. So we ended up. Um, so they they uh, they were already running their code successfully and had validated against experimental results with the Intel math libraries. And so whenever they were accept. Um, so whenever they got this, it was, oh, this is so much better, you know? Um, and um, so, so those are, um, th those are the things. The people that were really impacted or um, are the climate modelers and the climate modelers seem to be particularly sensitive to the last bit accuracy because it causes their models to diverge and the people, that I talked to said they can they should just link with CR libm and um, and they can do that and um, other people said that oh well they need to get their algorithms in line so they don't um, diverge so much with less bit accuracy so anyway that's my feedback on that one uh, thank you I also wanted to uh, report that. Uh, at Cauldron 2019, um, it was reported that some academics were shocked by any loss of accuracy in an, in an official library. Uh, so that there is some people arguing that even this uh, massive, massive performance gain at a, a small bit accuracy is uh, not desirable. So getting into the philosophical discussions now, and and the guidelines really not just philosophy we're between i think we're somewhere between academic precision over all else and marketing performance over all else so how how do we make these uh considerations best precision or whatever you know predictability of performance is a possible consideration as as was just mentioned that sometimes um uh, Uniformity of, of expectation performance really matters, uh, getting the same amount of time repeatedly. How frequently you get wrong answers. In some cases, uh, it's basically a problem to rarely get a wrong answer because then you think you've validated your, your program on a limited set of test data and you run it on a broader set of test data and, and you don't even know you're getting wrong answers. Uh, and the size of the errors clearly is important. Uh, one of bits is one thing, but 20 or more bits wrong just is a problem. And now I'd open up for, for the audience to uh, offer their opinions and thoughts. So my, my personal opinion on this one is number one, in addition to publishing performance information and running against a set of known test values. Um, I mean, I'm not going to claim to be a great coder or anything like that, but 
what I would say is um, one of the things um, that you should um, publish in suggesting a change is um, relative data in comparison to vendor libraries that are already in common use because um, many times the academics have already accepted the um, uh, the implicit errors in some vendor libraries and have validated their codes in those cases and um, and if they've already accepted it in for those cases then it's hard for them to argue that it uh, it's unworth it's not worth accepting the change here. Uh, thank you, Ben. That's useful. Uh. The other thing is, I, I did like, um, uh, I think it was Joseph Meyer, yeah, Joseph Meyer saying about how there were correctly rounded versions um, being implemented. Uh, and the correctly rounded aspect, uh, act, it would be useful for those people whose algorithms don't converge um, um, in cases where you do accumulate error. And with DJ's comment about could it be a tunable um, used in fast math, um, there are there are actually sort of library uh, already standardized modes of operation in the libraries um, where you say, oh, okay, always round up, always round down, give me the correctly rounded mode. Um, maybe using those um, to, as a initial selector function, um, um, almost ifunc or um, uh, plt got like would be a good way of, of uh, doing it. All right. Um, I suspect anyone who is using fast math is um, tolerating one or two bit errors to begin with. Fast math includes things like allowing uh, replacement of division by one over uh, the reciprocal as going back to the floating the complex divide we uh, compute t the denominator and then we two do two different divides with it i experimented with computing one over t and doing two multiplies with it and that loses us a, about a half bit of accuracy on average, sometimes as much as two bits, sometimes no change. Uh, and that's what uh, fast allows th that optimization. I didn't make that change in order to have comparable results and not um, complicate the decision. Um, so a couple things that people have brought up to me that could be used. Uh, the vector units on machines are notably deeper now. And, you know, sometimes in the places where you split a float into multiple, um, uh, multiple doubles um, and provide, uh, you could potentially rewrite the algorithms to use um, some of the vector ops for that. Um, or you could in parallel calculate one above and one below um, to, to kind of then use the derivative of the function to um, to come in come in and like tell which direction you need to round. The um, the thing is the actual flaws executed by the ALUs are not as critical anymore because the machines are mostly hamstrung by the um, memory bandwidth performance rather than the number of like in core uops that are dispatched to the ALUs. So you have um, so you have some new techniques to adapt to the architecture, the modern architectures that could help, but um, they aren't being implemented or even played with very. Much. And so I'll stop that. <laughs> 
Yes, that does make a tough challenge, especially for a generalized library like glibc or libgcc, when, as in this case, my changes were not, uh, the slowdowns were not based on counting multiplies and adds, which used to be the, the top issue, but instead on how many branches were put in there. And branches used to be almost free as compared to multiplies. I'm going back 20 years and comparing, but it, it just shows that over time, the issues change for tuning code to get the uh, best performance. And one of the things about that, though, is um, the architectures now uh, I do have deep pipelines and multiple ALUs that you can make use of as opposed to um, um, as opposed to the cost of uh, these uh, these the branches and the things like that which were much more important in older architectures so so that's one of um, one of the things that you should consider i mean and i don't think anything is going to change uh in the fundamental architecture you're still going to have um these i don't know uh in these particular in the current architectures going forward because we're all constrained on memory bandwidth yes uh since we are running uh near the end of the meeting i just wanted to briefly touch on on other math library issues because i didn't see any other uh, sessions on these sorts of things. Uh, LibM has gotten many improvements in recent years, and I'm really pleased to see that. And, and are there areas uh, that still need work? Some accuracy improvement, performance improvement? Paul Zimmerman has a, a um, short note comparing performance or comparing accuracy only for a number of single precision libraries between um, GNU uh, software and other vendors, showing that there's room for improvement, at least on x86 hardware. So anyone want to speak up as uh, that they're uh, inclined to work on these issues, assigned to work on these issues? And are there other things that we need to be thinking about for math libraries? I'm going to uh, say that number one, the whole range of uh, uh, having a re uh, accuracy across a whole range, the range of doubles is not as important as operating in the immediate vicinity of zero. Um, there's implicit um, needs for accuracy, um, and also I, I uh, expect. Another thing that's important as we move forward is the vector version of these math libraries. Oh, excellent feedback there. So I don't hear um, Joseph chiming in on, on the thread, which, which is fine. Um, he, he probably is the right person to speak for glipsy on this. But uh, as a GCC hacker, what I see is um, we have slowed down how many, how much time people are spending on glibc math. So there was a period of time, you know, maybe uh, starting maybe seven years ago and, and kind of ending maybe two years ago where people really did spend some time focused on the, the uh, accuracy and performance of, of GC or of glibc's live app. I don't think we currently have anybody on the Red Hat side tasked for that. It's on demand as needed right now, Patrick. Um, oh, right. The guys that have done the most work recently are um, ARCH64 focused um, and, and the various Lenaro partners uh, have done most of the work more recently. And I don't know what specifically is driving them. I don't know if, they, if oh, there's particular customer problems they're trying to tackle or not. I can say the thing that's driving them is um, uh, our implementation sucked particularly bad on, on AR64, and so they heard it from people, and plus also a big target market for ARM has been HPC. Good to know that, thanks. 
Right. Something else I noticed is um, the Intel compiler and libraries take advantage of knowing that there's an 80-bit uh, implementation for getting a little better accuracy. And ARM doesn't have that 80-bit option. So using the standard uh, glibc is, needs to be tuned in some cases. And I see our time is up. So yeah, uh, um, sorry, just one little thing, because uh, with all that discussion about performance and accuracy, I got confused. What is the current status of the complex divide that you sent? for libgcc i mean is that something ah. that can we put it in libgcc or is there a major problem with it what's the status with that it's I'm pending hoping review. That i can yeah it needs review i'm hoping joseph can chime in he knows more about the math side than than it, than myself certainly um so it's it certainly it's in the queue uh we just got to find somebody that uh wants to review it and has the yeah. the background to do so Oh, and, and I should mention that I'm going to uh, submit a, a revised version either today or tomorrow because in preparing this talk, I saw an opportunity to get the results I, I showed here. It's, it's a small thing, but it is, if we're going to make the change, do it right. Okay. And Joseph uh, indicated in the chat room that uh, he needs time to review some papers on the subject. Yes, there's... <laughs> there, there is a modest amount of, of work in that area, uh, but it, it <laughs> does we, seem to be stretched out over the last 50 years. Yes, this has been going on a long time, so I think we probably got to give the room back. I think Ulrich's about to yeah. tell us to stop. <laughs> if anyone wants to continue, I'm uh, available for uh, one of the hack rooms. Just mention it in the chat, or I'll go join one now. Okay, and with that said, uh, thank you, Patrick. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Please feel free to continue in the hack room, as you said. And so now we'll have another three-minute break before we head into the lightning talks.
Testing, testing. Uh, can people hear me okay? I can hear you, Maxim. I'll give one last try with the webcam. Okay. Uh -huh. Looks like everything decided to work in the end. So uh, tell me when I can start and uh, I'll get going. I can start. Okay. Uh, hi everyone. My name is Maxim Blenov. I work for a company called Embicosm, and today I'm going to be giving a brief presentation about some of the work that we've been doing for the uh, RISC V Bitmanip optimizations. So, first of all, a uh, short introduction. Bitmanip is a recent extension to the RISC V architecture, currently version 0.92, was developed by Claire Wolf and Ken Doxer. There's about 50 new instructions across nine sub extensions. And it'll become evident what it, I mean by sub-extension. And uh, it's already planned to be supported in LLVM 11. And uh, for GCC, there's currently an experimental branch at the URLs listed below. So uh, the primary motivation of this extension is to help optimize code and help optimize speed for binary arithmetic. So what you're looking at here is a matrix of benchmark results for the uh, using the mBench test suite. So on the left, this on the left, what you see is the I've split it up into each sub extension of Bitmanip. So Bitmanip, I should have had the slide at the very beginning, but uh, it's grouped into a set of different groups of instructions. And ZBS is single bit set and unset. ZBB is like the whole thing. ZBP is permutation instructions. And so on the top, you've got each benchmark. And at the bottom, the bottom most on the and the rightmost data sets are the ones that are. Uh, so the really interesting ones. So the bottom ones show which benchmark uh, has the most to gain from Bitmanip enablement, and on the right you can see is the for each how much each subset contributes. And so in particular of interest is the uh, SHA-256 benchmark, which uh, benefits a great deal from rotates, uh, taking advantage of the rotate instructions. And on the right uh, you can see that the the biggest contributors are the permutation, is the uh, permutation subset. So I'll talk a little bit more about, there's also a speed improvement. This is using a very related core. Uh, Claire Wolf has developed a, a Bitmanip core for the Pico RV32 microprocessor, which we then very late and then simulate under GDB. And so you can see that the performance gains are actually about, they track quite closely the size gains. So in particular, the SHA-256 benchmark benefits a great deal from the rotate instructions, uh, which the CPU can connect natively. And I think Pico JPEG is also similar. It's thanks to rotates and the bit set unset instructions. So um, uh, to give a concrete example of what these instructions actually look like, here's a, a simple example, a case study of the SB set instruction, which belongs to the SBS subset. And uh, so this greatly simplifies if you want to set a single bit, like a flag or something, or just a power of two integer. And before you would have to uh, construct it and then load it, whereas now you can just have a single instruction. So here's an example of uh, the situation when the default RB32 IMC target without Bitmanip. On the left is just some example code I came up with. It's kind of arbitrary, but you can imagine something like this being in the code base somewhere. And on the right, I've highlighted in yellow the instructions which really can, are which with the operations you see here on the, on the left with the uh, flags variable being set. So you've got to load the upper, then you OR in the lower, and then that way you have to shuffle in the data, so to speak. 
Whereas with a single bit set instruction, it all folds down. So the GCC can actually extract from the uh, generic C implementation the you know what exactly you're trying to do and consequently can decrease the code size. And so this is particularly nice because we don't really have to do much in terms of the in the uh, really nitty gritty uh, you know, the C code parts. We can just write out the RTL and the templates and the GCC will do everything for us. And the code, uh, code bases that have these generic operations will also benefit. So GCC is happy to convert the shifts and masks and whatnot, and it saves on code size quite significantly. Uh, another instruction, and this was sort of uh, a secondary part, the previous example with set bit, that was uh, an upstream instruction, whereas this is something that we've been doing uh, here at Embicosm. Uh, we were faced with a real-world situation where we had an existing core that was designed around two input operations. And uh, implementing ternary support for the CMove instruction, which is the conditional move, would have been quite expensive for the uh, for the hardware people, right? Uh, they had an existing piece of IP. They didn't want to modify it significantly just for one instruction. But at the same time, the CMove instruction is attractive because it means, in some cases, you can replace the branch instruction. And in this particular case, the branch prediction was such that uh, being able to get rid of a, a branch instruction is a big win. So. Uh, in, in case if, if the instruction fails, there's a big penalty. If the branch fails, there'll be a big penalty. But if we don't have a branch, then we don't have the penalty. And so, well, conditional move is three input, right? It's if A, then load B, otherwise load C. Well, what about just two input? So if the predicate is true, we load the operand, otherwise we do nothing, right? And so what we did was we took, we implemented the three input conditional move, and we implemented the two input conditional move. And what we found was actually GCC is quite happy to use the two input conditional move as much as the three input. Uh, granted, there's now this move. So in in the past, you could do all you could do the whole ternary C operation at once uh, that mapped directly to the conditional move. Whereas now you have to do uh, as well as the C move to the two represents the two input, the single input rather, or the, or the two two operand, but one operand is a predicate and the other is the argument. You have to do the move to assume that you, do, you that you fail. And then you do the C move too, and if that succeeds, then you move in, and if it fails, then that's taken into account by the previous move. Uh, but what's satisfying is that GCC, it appears and it can handle both, so to speak. And in some cases, actually, uh, the register allocation is such that there is no, it, it doesn't even have a move in it already. The, the register is already in the right place at the right time, such that the, the code size is improved in both cases. And so what we found was actually the two input conditional move is just as uh, prevalent as the three input. And so that, that was an interesting uh, uh, scenario where actually we could uh, predict ahead of time before having to make expensive modifications to the, uh, to the hardware what the benefit was going to be by, having, by uh, simplifying the instruction down to the two input variant. And so that was a sort of a, an interesting lesson, I suppose, in looking at whether something was going to be worthwhile before actually committing to the expensive changes. And so this is the last slide. And uh, this is now the slide that I wish was at the beginning in retrospect. This is what the actual whole set of bitmanip instruction, bit instructions uh, is consisted of. There's nine sets, as you can see, the ZBS, ZBP, and the instructions they live in these sets. Some of them overlap. It's a bit uh, perhaps complicated, but and in yellow highlight, that's the ones for which GCC is currently capable of generating, for which it has machine descriptions for. So it can gen use these instructions in generic code. You don't have to, you don't have to call uh, intrinsics or anything like that. Uh, the CMove one in particular, that's we haven't upstreamed that yet, but there is an implementation of that that exists in our repositories that GCC is capable of using CMove. And uh, there's still a lot of opportunity for some of these. Uh, I think, I'm not sure PAC might already have machine descriptions for it too, but there are some pretty, there are still some low hanging fruits here, I would say that, you know, it, it would be good to get them cleaned up and have GCC capable of generating patterns for. So uh, that's the end of my talk, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you very much.
Well, by the way, I can't hear what you're saying for some reason. So just in case you want to address me, uh, please do so through the chat. I'm not sure what's wrong with my machine. Okay, let me try again. Can anybody hear me now? Oh, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, yeah. Good. Well, at least that works again. So uh, I just wanted to thank you again, Maxim, for the talk. And now we have another three-minute break before we start with the next lightning talk. And it is Jeremy Bennett who is up next. Just do a sound check, Ulrich. I can hear you. Good. Let me put up your charts. Uh, let's see. Okay, and I, I guess you can Thank you. present it yourself. Yeah. Okay. A couple of minutes. I'm just looking at a radar map that the uh, out to the west and north of me are thunderstorms raging and a question of whether I'll get through my lightning talk before they hit there to the west and the winds blowing east blowing them eastward. So, there we are. Okay, so up next will be Jeremy Baird with the lightning talk on the GNU toolchain support for Core V. So take it away, Jeremy. Thank you, Ulrich. So um, just a little update on a project that I'm working on. Um, so Core 5 is derivative of Risk 5. A reminder of Risk 5 for anyone who doesn't know, uh, it's an archetypal risk processor, 32 general purpose registers, a program counter, and like all modern processes, 4,000 odd uh, special purpose registers, uh, control and status registers. And it can be one or multiple cores. The term risk five uses hardware thread, heart, um, which is not quite the same thing as a core, but at a first approximation, it is the same, and a block of memory. And that's basically it. But the key thing about risk five is extensible. So you have a base instruction set. Uh, which can be 32-bit, 64-bit, or potentially 128-bit, and in fact, there's a cut-down one for embedded use. And I've highlighted in green uh, those which are ratified, and in red those which are not. So RV32i and 64i, the base integer instruction sets, are both ratified. And then there are a series of official ISA extensions. 
um, ones for multiplication, atomics, floating points of all sorts of precision, uh, a shorthand for all of those, which is G, compressed instructions, and then ones for decimal arithmetic, bit manipulation, just in time, uh, DSP, vector, I've lost count. Um, and you can see we're getting through the alphabet quite fast, and the proposal is in the future. Uh, official, official extensions will be Z and something ex more explanatory. Um, that is the canonical ordering when you to make it easy to parse arguments. If you specify multiple ISA extensions, that's the order you, sh you should specify them in. And then the whole point is extensible, not just by the risk Five Foundation, but by customers or by vendors. So there's a scope for vendor extensions. I'm going to talk about one from the Parallel Ultra Low Power Project at ETH Zurich and University of Bologna. But in general, in future, they should begin YXXX where it's something sensible. Okay, next slide. So, so, and you can see it's risk, you can get all the instructions for the baseline and the, all the common ratified extensions on one card. And it is extensible, it has extensible instruction sets. So you can have 16-bit instructions, 32-bit instructions, 48-bit, 64-bit. Now, no one, as far as I'm aware, has implemented anything beyond 32-bit. But it is designed to be infinitely extensible as an instruction set. And that extensibility is controlled through the low-order bits of the instruction. And there's the patterns there that comes out of the uh, official spec. Okay. Now, if we just look at the 32-bit instructions, you can see there's an opcode field at the bottom of seven bits. Well, I've explained that already um, that some of those bits in that opcode field are used to decide if you're a 16-bit or a 48-bit or bigger instruction. So in practice, you've only got five bits of those, and one of those combinations isn't available to you, or four of those aren't available to you anyway. So um, you have additional fields for most of those, they're function groups, and you have func3 and func7 fields to differentiate multiple instructions within those groups. Though there are a small number of instructions that don't have that, and therefore use up a whole one of those opcodes, and that will become important in a minute. There, if we look at those five bit fields, this is what the 32 bit groups are. You know that they're of the form XX, BBB, and 11, that makes it 32 bit instruction, and BBB can't be 111. So you've got 28 opcode groups, and those are the ones that the official RISC-V standards used. And for good measure, RISC-V reserves three more. So there are only four available for the customer to have custom extensions in. And in fact, it gets worse than that, which is that custom two and custom three are actually reserved for future risc five one two eight. So it's a pretty small amount of the instruction space is available to customer uh, instructions um, if you're going to stick in a 32-bit opcode. Okay. So that's a bit of background about RISC-V on this. Parallel Ultra Low Power project that's been going on before RISC-V out of the University of Bologna and uh, ETH Zurich, led by Luca Benini at ETH Zurich. Um, and it's a family of processors all gained all geared towards very very low power and uh, uh parallel multi-core solutions and they used to be based on open risk these days they're based on risk five and they have their own risk fives and this is the simpler than the, um, the risky core which is a 32-bit four stage in order rv32 imfc okay but interestingly culp pulp has added some custom extensions some post increment, multiply, accumulate, and some early extensions, some hardware loops. And it's added bit manipulation and SIMD because those were added before the proposed official extensions of B and P were created. So they're different to the official ones, but they exist there as well. Now, so we understand where this is going, we need to understand RISC V is a standardization body, hardware standardization body, plus bits of software around the hardware. And the people driving, there are individual organizations making chips, but two industry bodies have coalesced, each with 50 or so members, um, uh, the Chips Alliance and the Open Hardware Group. And both are committed to creating standard RISC-V cores that are verified and validated that people can pick up and use. Okay, And for my sins, I'm head of software for the Open Hardware Group. So 
Here is the Core 5, that's the Risk Open Hardware Group's Core 5 CV32E40P. This is the 32-bit embedded class MCU class processor being developed, developed by uh, the, core, the Open Hardware Group. And it's not the only core they're developing, but it's the first one. And you'll notice this diagram is very familiar because it's the pulp whiskey core. So how do we take a research core from a university and turn it into a production core? Well, the hardware, we know how to do with hardware. We have a robust verification program using absolutely standard hardware design flows there. That's well underway. What about the software? Ah, oh, well. We need GNU tools, Clang LLVM tools, all the associated libraries, the low level utilities. We need real time operating systems of all flavors. We need full fat operating systems, Linux, various BSDs. We need IDEs, Eclipse, uh, if it's various flavors, platform IO, and we need simulators, cycle accurate simulators, system simulators, uh, instruction set simulators. Um, that's quite a big shopping list. And we need, we've got a reference platform they've all got to work on, and that's being demonstrated on the 15th of September. So let's start. If you don't start, you won't get anywhere. So I'm going to look at the GNU tools, and I've got a team working on that out of my team. Um, so there's already a full GNU tool chain. It supports about 150 new instruction types, all those pulp extensions. It's about 350 if you count all the invariants, OK? And it's based on GCC 7.1 from 2017. Okay. Um, but the problem is it's a university research compiler. It's about pushing forward research. It's not a, their job is not to develop production compilers. They want to try things out. There are no tests in there. There aren't even the upstream tests in generic risk five because it predates those being written. There is absolutely no adherence to new coding standards. There are cross repository uh, include files that uh, assume your repositories are sitting in a particular hierarchy and the implementation tramples all over the reserved risk 5 coding space and that was the reason i explained about the coding space earlier so how do we get it into core 5 and turn it into a robust tool chain well first of all we ask our hardware colleagues to move the instruction codings into the custom 0123 blocks okay if we do that there's no way we can ever upstream this because quite properly it wouldn't be accepted because it would torch the risk the existing risk 5 stuff so the second thing is we know that the product will move to the official SIMD and bit manipulation. So let's not worry about those. And that takes out a huge chunk of what we have to do. And that leaves us with a project then with our nicely encoded instructions of updating the GNU tool chain. And the strategy we thought was, well, Binutils GDB is pretty stable. Let's just test what we've got. And then we can roll that forward to 2020. GCC has changed a lot. So for that, we um, we we uh, port the pulp changes to um, straight onto GCC 2020. It's not a small task, but it's better than trying to roll forward GCC. Where have we got to? The backporting of tests failed. Binutils GDB may have may be pretty stable, but Risk Five Binutils port has changed a lot in three years. And there's all the other research code in there that gets under your feet. So. We're restarting adding pulp commits to 2020 bin utils GDB, and we can just select the core five features we want. Okay, and then we're sort of asking, should we use CGen instead, given we've already got a full risk five implementation? It'd probably be a lot easier. Okay, and but a central principle of the open hardware group is we must upstream, open source work must be contributed back and shared. So, how do we do that? We're going to need to choose a target triplet for non official risk five ports. Okay, and as we know, triplets have five fields, and we're proposing using the core V as a vendor field. Okay, and then we'll add architecture specific options, Y, core V, X, X, X. Okay, which will allow discrimination between core five, eight features. We'll start with bin utils, then do GCC, then do newlib. And I couldn't resist having a poll. Are we going about this the right way? Two votes, yes or no, and I'm out of time if you'd care to vote. Right, time, time's up. So everyone thinks I'm doing it the right way, but only seven people actually voted on it. Well, so that, 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 thank you very much for, uh, for those who did support it. OK, um, we're out of time. And so um, we have a few minutes before the um, uh, next session um, a break. And then the next speaker uh, will start in a few minutes time. 
uh, on including the editor with the compiler. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Jeremy. And I guess this concludes the first half of today's session. For the second half, I'll pass over the moderator hat to you, Jeremy. So, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, all, Rick, uh, for for your session as uh, as presenter. All right. Can you hear me? I, Andrea, you're loud and clear. You're showing up good on the video. Um, uh, I will pop your slides up uh, for you. Uh, no, Thank actually, you Sarah, much. I think it's going to pop your. Sarah will put your slides up for you because she'll get it right. Um, <laughs> and uh, I should mention, sitting in the background is Sarah Cook, who many of you will know from past Canoe Cauldrons who's been gently making sure that the right presentations appear at the right time. Um, uh, so thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, we'll give you, we've got, you've got a couple of minutes, uh, Andrea, we'll wait until half past the hour to make sure yeah. that it's coming in on YouTube to pick you up. Perhaps we can make a poll to fill this, uh, this two minutes. <laughs> Well, I should warn you, as I discovered the hard way yesterday, when you start a poll, you have no option but to take it to its conclusion, and it is then stuck to your slide forever. Um, yeah, it's okay. So, Emacs uh, users, uh, please respond, uh, answer yes. No Emacs user, no. Oh, wow, we are doing strong. <laughs> All right, so I'll publish the results. There we are. Well, that's impressive. Well, usually you do, you ask a question, then you say, I'll adjust my presentation accordingly. But I'll be honest, I just have one presentation, so I will not adjust anything. <laughs> Uh, you, you, you've attracted the audience better than me. I only got seven people to vote on my poll. <laughs> well, it's a subject uh, that probably generates some interest. I don't know. Can move with the keyboard. Yes, I can. All right. So I'll try to keep the presentation short because I'm quite interested in some feedback. Um, okay. I think you're I'm good sure to go, Andrea. Over to you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, all right. So hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Andrea Corallo. I work as a compiler engineer in ARM, and this is about my hobby project. I think I toyed with this stuff for about the last one year and a half. And it's about having Emacs uh, able to compile Emacs Lisp to native code using the GCC infrastructure. So I'd like to touch base a little bit on what Emacs is uh, and how it works before explaining uh, what we are trying to do. Um, so yeah, what Emacs is, uh, there are many definitions for that. Some are good, some less. Probably they're coming from Vim users. But I'll give you mine. Uh, I think a good definition is that it's a Lisp implementation. Uh, and its main task is to stay between us and our primitive operating system and doing a lot of uh, heavy lifting of uh, unstructured text, putting it into some uh, uh, specific Lisp data structure that can be shared between different Lisp programs. So in my opinion, it makes really computing uh, really pleasant finally. Uh, and regarding Emacs Lisp, well, that's an interesting subject. 
Um, it's a dialect of Lisp. It's not defined by any specific uh, standard, but, but just by the Emacs implementation. Uh, and uh, I think it's a fact that uh, given you can do almost any task with it, um, the implementation, it's, uh, it's a testament to the flexibility of the implementation, but also that there must be a lot of Lisp around to do all these tasks. So I wanted to take some statistics and I did some research and I found that exist more than 10 million of line of code of Emacs Lisp that it's really a lot. Uh, it's really like uh, one third of the kernel Linux. And you, you may say yes, Andrea, but it's just because it, it, GNU Emacs it's around since forever. But you may be right, but I found another website with some stats from uh, uh, GitHub. And uh, apparently, if I read these stats correctly, uh, like every 28 uh, pushes of C++, there is one of uh, Elise. That really blows my mind if that's true. Uh, so yeah, it's still a thing, and we are doing quite strong, I think. Uh, regarding Lisp, um, it's a dynamic programming language. It's so iconic. Uh, that means that you can finally do metaprogramming as we should always have done. And Alan Kay defined it as the Maxwell equation of the software. And uh, I think what he meant uh, was that uh, it's based on few principles. It's really symmetric and has really few primitives. Uh, so uh, it should be easy to learn and easy to implement. I mean, it sounds great. Huh? And you are entitled to ask, uh, OK, how many primitives do you have in Elisp then? Uh, I mean, Maxwell equations are four, so I don't know, four, five, 10, 20. Well, uh, not quite. We have about uh, 1,500 uh, uh, yeah, primitive functions that are implemented in C within Emacs. And the reason for that is mainly performance. So traditionally, every piece of uh, code that uh, had some performance impact was uh, uh, written, uh, was ported into C. But this has been the nightmare for uh, anyone who tried to port Emacs on top of a different uh, implementation. Because either you implement all these uh, 1,500 and so functions, uh, or you have to cooperate with them. And if you want to cooperate with them, the trouble is that you have to share also the internal data representation. So it's very complex. That's really the reason why nobody ever showed up saying, hey, I ported Emacs on top of Common Lisp. Um, so talking about the vanilla implementation of GNU Emacs, uh, as I said, we have a lot of C. It's about 30% of the code base. Uh, and Lisp can run uh, interpreted or byte compiled. The byte compiler, though, it's written in Emacs Lisp itself. So yeah, Emacs requires uh, to go through Bootstrap. So I don't see any reason why a toolchain engineer should use anything different as an editor. And the byte compiled code, can uh, uh, it's run on a virtual machine that is a stack-based one. Uh, so I listed a few points where I think uh, uh, Emacs Lisp could improve. Uh, well, namespaces, we don't have namespaces. Uh, extensibility, more on that later. Uh, performance and uh, debugability and compile time errors. Uh, so I think uh, uh, the work that I'm presenting impact mainly performance because it's a rework of the execution engine. Somehow, let's call it like that. But I hope uh, uh, that in the future, it will impact also extensibility and compile time errors and warnings. Um, so why it's beneficial to improve the Emacs performance? Well, mainly for two reasons. Uh, one is that uh, uh, we could write less C or maintain less C. Uh, and the second one is extensibility, because people that are writing Emacs Lisp outside uh, Emacs Devel and Emacs Core could benefit from that. So at, at the moment, if you need to write something that is fast, you need to write C. So you need to be like an Emacs core hacker. And I think it would be beneficial to, to enable that. Uh, so yeah, how the implementation is working? Um, well, first, uh, uh, Lisp objects. These are target pointers. Um, so basically, word where we reserve few uh, bits uh, to indicate the type, uh, the, point, the type of the object uh, that the pointer is pointing to. Uh, and it's all like that, except for fixed numbers that are integers that we can fit directly into the word. Uh, so small integers. Uh, regarding the code and the Emacs Lisp uh, VM, uh, well, it works like that roughly. So if we have a Lisp expression, uh, that is the Lisp way to write uh, a plus two multiplied by three, uh, the byte compiler will produce uh, uh, as an output this lap program, where lap stands for Lisp assembly program. Uh, and it's basically the assembly that then gets uh, assembled into bytecode. 
Uh, if we execute this, we will execute it in an execution stack uh, that we manipulate in the runtime. So the first uh, uh, instruction is pushing the value of A that I decided uh, being 100 in this case. Then we push two, and then the plus uh, uh, operator is popping two operands and pushing the result. And so on, we push three, we do the multiplication, we can return. Uh, obviously, it's a little bit more complex. We have also uh, conditional and conditional branches and non-local exit, but this is roughly the idea. Uh, the vanilla byte compiler pipeline, it looks like this. We have a first pass of micro expansion well, where we resolve uh, all the metaprogramming if you want. Then we remove closures. We do some source level optimization and then we have a single pass that is working basically the tree and producing this lap that we have seen. Then we do some people optimization and we assemble into bytecode. So in terms of intermediate representations, it, it looks like this. And the idea is to do something like this. So to do something and to enter into libgcgtir and then go through the uh, conventional GCC uh, compiler pipeline. Um, so libgcgt, uh, it was added by uh, Dave, I believe, in GC5. So I realize I never thank, uh, say thanks to Dave for that, but well, I think it's a good moment. Uh, you are enabling us for a lot of fun. I think you did an incredible job. Uh, anyway, you describe to libgcgit what it's uh, like a C ish semantic. It's a subset of C, actually. And it's good for making both jitters or head of time compilers, despite the name. Uh, so we can imagine a simple translation taking advantage of the fact that uh, uh, in Emacs, this bytecode, uh, for every program counter, the stack death of uh, the runtime execution stack, it's known at compile time. So given this property, we can basically name all the slots uh, of this stack. Uh, and produce this uh, kind of pseudo assembly. Uh, you can do that and it works perfectly. Um, probably if you do that and you just open code a few functions, uh, you will be able to measure like uh, roughly a 3x performance uplift. And that's it. So it's cool, but I, I thought it was maybe the occasion to try to do something a little bit more, both in terms of performance, both in terms of, uh, uh, say, to chain infrastructure. Uh, so the idea is to implement some kind of uh, optimizing uh, um, logic before entering into the GCC pipeline that takes advantage of the specific Emacs uh, Lisp semantic and the environment uh, values. Uh, and also, I hope this in the future will be able to, to provide better uh, um, warning and errors uh, at compile time to the user. Uh, so this is the uh, pipeline of the native compiler that I came up with. Uh, and in terms of uh, um, language it's coded in, uh, all these passes are written in Lisp, except the last one that it's uh, written in C. And talking about the uh, intermediate representation that they use, uh, here it's listed. Uh, so more on that uh, uh, very soon. I think we can go through um, a few of these passes, the ones that are more interesting. So the first pass, it's basically responsible for running the byte compiler infrastructure and spilling uh, the lab that it's uh, the main input for our compilation. Um, this pass is called the Limplify, and it's responsible for taking lab and converting it uh, into Limpol. That is named like that uh, as a tribute to GCC Gimpol, obviously. Uh, Limpol, it's a uh, uh, SSA, a control flow graph based, so uh, representation. If you want to uh, look uh, what it looks like, uh, here it is. So we have basic blocks, we have five functions, uh, and all you can expect, basically. And we also syntax highlighted because we are uh, very good at, obviously. Um, the following pass, it's forward propagation. Uh, so it does mainly three things. It's um, propagating types and values within the SSA lattice. And it's also executing pure functions uh, when it's found that a pure function has all uh, known input parameters. This pass is a little bit more uh, uh, Emacs specific. Uh, so the fact is uh, that in Emacs Lisp, function calls are uh, very slow, so very expensive. And the reason for that is that most of these are going through a trampoline that is called fun call. And this piece of code, it's slow because it's complex. Because in Emacs Lisp, you have to consider that we have uh, interpreted code, byte compiled code, now native one. You can have also advised one that is the equivalent of um, decorated functions. So the routing is really not simple. 
And also when we call primitive functions, unless uh, uh, the primitive function originally got uh, a dedicated OP code in the OP space when the uh, byte compiler was written, um, we still do an indirect call going through the trampoline. So this pass is responsible for rewriting these function calls to primitives uh, in this way. Um, but it does also another similar optimization that is of this case. So if within the same compilation unit, the function foo is called in function bar, then depending on the setting of uh, the optimization level, instead of going through the trampoline, we rewrite it like that. Not that this is not 100% uh, legal, uh, because uh, in MaxLisp it's a dynamic programming language, so actually bar could be redefined uh, uh, later on. And if we do this, it will not take effect. But we do, but we do this optimization depending on the on the optimization setting. So we decide we can cheat in certain conditions. Obviously, this gives uh, an enormous performance uh, performance benefit, uh, and it allows also uh, for all the GCC IPA logic to run effectively. Then we have a pass that is trying basically just to prove uh, all the functions that are pure, uh, the functions being compiled. Uh, this simple pass is doing basically ter recursion elimination, so it's uh, pattern matching um, recursive call in tail position and it's rewriting them with a go to plus some uh, parameter adjustment. And the last pass, it's mainly responsible for taking this limpol uh, intermediate representation and translating it into libgcgtir and driving the compilation. Um, but it does a couple of things more. So it's exposing to GCC a bunch of accessor functions so they can be open coded. Uh, and also the code generation here um, may depend uh, on the type of the objects that uh, has been proved by the previous passes. So the, um, the list of passes that we have seen uh, take advantage, advantage of uh, three new concepts that we are, um, we are adding to Emacs Lisp. Uh, one, it's uh, the speed parameter that is the equivalent of uh, dash O for GCC. So basically it's the optimization level. It goes from zero to three. And the idea is that at three, we decide that we do some optimization that uh, the original Emacs Lisp semantic would not allow. This is a necessary evil if, you, if we want to fill the gap between Lisp and C. There is, there is really no other way. The other concept is the concept of compilation unit. Uh, remember uh, the example of the call from foo to bar within the compilation unit. So it's introduced that way, but it's also a first class object. Um, because Lisp, it's a, it's a dynamic programming language. We can allocate object, we can generate object, but from time to time we have to free them. So every function as a reference to the original compilation unit was loaded from. Uh, and as you can see, the garbage collector can reach uh, uh, each function through its name, that in Lisp, it's a symbol. Uh, so in case function three and four gets undefined in this case, they are not anymore reachable, so they get garbage collected. Uh, and also compilation unit is a, is a consequence. Underneath, this is uh, the close. Uh, the last concept that we are introducing is compiler ins. So it's a bunch of uh, low level primitives uh, where you can promise to the compiler that some expression evaluate to a certain type. So if you have uh, uh, basically x equal x plus one um, in a loop, it may be very useful to promise that you are not overflowing the fixed num. Um, and this will at speed free uh, basically generate code that does remove some type check. Uh, but depending on the optimization level, uh, we will generate either code without emitting type checks or either we emit assertions. Typically, they are assertions. Okay, I wanted to talk a little bit about the compilation model because it's interesting. So the, this compiler was born as an end-of-time end compiler. So it's uh, uh, functionally it's a superset of a jitter if you want, because you can also save the output and reload it. Uh, but recently, we moved to an hybrid approach. Uh, so we always add of time compile the Emacs image that it's a result of the Emacs uh, bootstrap. So Emacs bootstrap, then it loads all, uh, all these objects, all these definitions, and then dump itself into an image that is the one that we invoke uh, calling Emacs from the shell. Uh, so this is always add of time compiled. Uh, but the rest of the Emacs distribution uh, can be both add of time compiled or JIT like compiled, depending on how you build uh, Emacs. Well, typically packages are always JIT-like uh, JIT compiled. What I mean by JIT-like compiled? So the trigger of the compilation is JIT-like, so uh, when it's needed. But um, 
And the compilation is happening in a parallel way, in a synchronous fashion. Uh, we can restore the compilation output, so it gets reused uh, for, for the next sessions. And we have learned how to auto swap definitions. So we do all the time because uh, it's extremely cool. So it works like that. Suppose, uh, assume that at T0, you load some bytecode and there is no com corresponding native code in the system already. Well, we will spawn a, a native compilation that it's an asynchronous process. And the T1, when the compilation is finished, uh, we will out, out swap the definition. So the user will be able to use the system. Uh, there is no interruption. And from T0 to T1, it's using the bytecode uh, definition. And after T1, it starts using the native code definitions. We handle all of this with the compilation queue, and you can decide the, the parallelism level that you want to dedicate to that. So let's say that you choose free. You may get a situation of this kind. So Emacs startup. So I've compiled a little bit itself, uh, and after a while it's fine. And, but in the meanwhile, you're still using it uh, in a transparent way, I'd say. Uh, so talking about performance, here I'm uh, showing up uh, uh, the results for the list benchmarks. That is a package of nano benchmarks that we have upstreamed in GNU Alpha. So it's, um, it's um, bytecode vs native code. Uh, well, yes. Um, some we compile very well, some we compile them okay. Uh, these three are completely optimized out at the moment. Um, so yeah, you can give the value you like, but I think we are doing pretty well there at least. Um, I thought it was interesting to list some takeaways for uh, libgcgit from our perspective. Well, first I think it works uh, great for us. I'm, I'm very satisfied. Uh, the compile time for the kind of application that we have and the um, compile model that we use, it's okay. So it doesn't matter if it's not really instantaneous. We prefer to have some performance more. It leaks memory though, but we are not impacted because we run this compilation into child processes, so it's, it doesn't matter. I think an area where I would like to improve the process is how to expose automatically more functions uh, um, to GCC given another file as an input. So maybe here I can I can get some advice, hopefully. Um, and yeah, I, I guess a number of uh, distros may like to fix their packages because I think uh, not everybody got it right for now. But yeah, it's great. It works for us. And uh, that's a project status. So it exists, I want to say. It's not a dream. <laughs> it's not a smoke where um, the development is happening on the official uh, Emacs Git uh, in a feature branch. So you can check it out and compile it uh, if you like. And if you report a bug, um, well, thank you very much. Uh, my personal goal would be to um, like finish it up for uh, Emacs 28. But uh, it's just my personal goal. We see how it goes. Uh, but yeah, it bootstrap and it's usable. I use it for my everyday production since uh, quite some time, and there are a surprising number of people that are using it already. Here I added my development blog, and if you want to discuss this stuff, um, I think Emacs Devel is a good place to do it. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Um, well, the kitchen thing. I think it's a little bit stuck, but we can still do something with it, perhaps. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to any feedback. Thank you, Andrea. Any questions for you? I was not paying attention to the chat. I'm sorry. Oh. Okay. Can you give us? Yes, yes, sure. Uh, so, one simple case is the one I showed. Uh, so, if you are within a, a same compilation a compilation unit and you have foo and bar, and uh, from foo you are calling bar, it works great till you, re you redefine bar because it should take effect but it will not. So actually, the thing that you have to remember is that uh, um, you will have to recompile the whole compilation unit and not just uh, uh, the, the color function. Uh, I think that's very acceptable because it's supposed to be used by people who are trying to squeeze out performance, replacing uh, 
C code. So it should be really for people who knows what they are doing. Because the other fact you have to consider is that uh, Emacs Lisp is supposed to be a safe programming language. Uh, so you should not be able to crash it. But for instance, if you start uh, uh, putting type ins here and there, and the promises that you are doing to the compiler are not true at speed free, you may crash Emacs. So that's another thing that is changing. Orin? Um The JVM deals with this problem by recording the optimization hints. So basically, once you start redefining a class, then everything that's being compiled gets invalidated and recompiled again with the new class definition. Maybe that's an option in the future. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sounds good. At the moment, uh, the main work is not in that area because um, probably there are things that are a little bit more urgent, but uh, it sounds like a good suggestion. I'd, I'd really be interested if you have any advice on how to expose uh, accessor functions using uh, an adder as an input. Because I remember a couple of years ago, I tried uh, compiling it using uh, LTO to link against, but I'm not sure it's the best approach. We have a number of comments on the subject of uh, leaking memory. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I think the trouble is that GCC for most of time it's not used through libgcg. So there are two problems that may be not that evident in in the conventional use that are memory leaks and if some pass, it's uh, forgetting to reset its state between different runs. Um, so that's another sensitive topic that it's difficult to verify, I think, or not trivial. Um, but we are not impacted because most of the time we run an asynchronous uh, child process. And we do that also not to fragment the memory um, because it wouldn't be good to allocate uh, all the time memory in your running Emacs. Dave. Yeah, that's kind of an ongoing treadmill of bug fixing where because the rest of the compiler assumes it's going to compile once and then the process goes away <laughs> um, rather than sticking around. Um, uh, uh, so I posted a link to the sort of ongoing bug where which is sort of uh, tracks that um, the you mentioned LTO and you mentioned accessors what were the yes um, what I LTO I guess ought to work I I, I hmm. so yeah so that was a suggestion from um, I think it was two three years ago and it led to my first GCC patch actually in Oh, okay. but, um, uh, yeah, so the idea that this guy suggested, I don't remember the name, was if you take the header and you compile it uh, uh, to an object file, uh, and then you link against doing LTO with your uh, uh, generated uh, uh, libgcg code, uh, you will get the definition of these inline functions somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's a little bit terrain for experimentation. So I had no time to really prove it in a larger scale. I'm not sure it's the best approach. And it, I guess it would not work with every uh, GCC. So uh, that's not my priority, priority at the moment. But I think it's really the last area that uh, we should explore as libgcg uh, um, from my point of view, mm -hmm. because Otherwise, every accessor function, you have to define it to libgcg and keep it in sync with uh, your other files. Uh, uh. Yeah, uh, this is something um, Vladimir spoke of in his talk on uh, Mir, um, I think a couple of days ago, um, that it's kind of a pain, well, it is a pain to, if you've got a C header file, API structs or whatever, to populate, describe that purely through the API. Um, and one approach there would be, um, and w I, there are a couple of ways of addressing that. Um, Vladimir has a, has his uh, Mir approach where you could just parse C code and generate this um, Mir description of it. And I've been, actually been hacking up a Mir to libgcc um, bridge um, <laughs> during the conference, as it were. Um, and the, the, another might be to use um, libabigail, 
Um, Lib Abigail is a, has a is a AB, ABI descri description um, library and format where you can um, expose um, the ABI, the struct layouts, I believe macro va values in an XML format, and there's a library for okay. working with that. So another approach, I guess, would be to sort of slurp your the API or ABI you want to consume. Uh, yeah, Mark's just posted a link in the, the chat mm -hmm. it, uh, into memory and then sort of slurp that into the LGCC yeah. context. So that having way. a translator, uh, XML or whatever it is to LibGCG, yeah. Yeah. Because so otherwise, a third approach would be to have LibGCG uh, instead of completely uh, autonomous front end to be able to invoke also the C front end, maybe to pull, C, to pull in definition, parsing maybe a file. Hmm. Hmm. Well, it's I guess it, yeah, it the question of why not simply spit out C um, and compile C code um, directly, uh, um, uh, which... Well, yeah, I think libgcg offers some uh, infrastructure. Uh, so I consider that too, and uh, I think I would have re-implemented uh, a lot of things that you have implemented already in libgcg mm. even if it's just to print uh, C. Um, and in general, it's more aesthetic, uh, obviously, to to use the, the libgcg approach. OK, I think we're going to have to call time there. Um, we've uh, Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, good conversation. Thank you for the input from people. Thank you. We've got a couple of minutes, and then Martin uh, Sable will be talking to us about uh, the state of flow-based diagnostics, diagnostics in GCC. Um, and uh, Martin, I will make you presenter. Okay, um, how is my audio? It's brilliant. You exist twice on my system, so I'm not sure if I'm going to... Let me try giving you one of them as presenter. If it doesn't work, I'll give the other one. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I am logged in on two different machines, so hopefully you can okay. sort it out. If not, I can log out on the other. Have you got presenter now? Can you move your slides forward and backwards? Um. On the wrong machine. I can switch machines easily enough. Yeah, I, I think you picked the, <laughs> the other machine. Try that now. See if that's better. Yep. Okay. okay good. Do I need to upload my slides, or I uploaded them yesterday? Yeah, they're there. Can you not? Can you see them? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I see them now. Okay. Yeah, and you can move them forward and back. Excellent. Okay. Good. Perfect. Okay, Thank you. Uh, we've we've got just a minute before we'll start, so we start on the dot. Okay, Martin, all yours. Thanks, Jeremy. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to Flow-Based Diagnostics in uh, GCC. My name is Martin Seabor, and I am a principal engineer with uh, the Red Hat Toolchain team. Um, I've spent the uh, last 10 years working on security-focused improvements to uh, the GCC toolchain and uh, um, years ago also to uh, LLVM. Uh, in the last five years of which at Red Hat, um, where my primary uh, area of interest has been flow-based diagnostics um, in the GCC middle end. Um, in the next 25 minutes, I'd like to give uh, an update on the status of the uh, existing flow-based warnings in GCC that I've either uh, uh, developed myself or enhanced. 
um, talk about the projects I'm working on for uh, GCC 11 um, and uh, share some of my ideas for uh, future opportunities in this space. I'm going to start by uh, giving a very quick overview of uh, GCC warnings in general, uh, describe what I mean by flow-based middle-end warnings, uh, and then uh, go over the status of the existing flow-based warnings in GCC. I'm going to uh, uh, describe uh, just briefly their implementation strategy and, and discuss their uh, most notable strengths and uh, spend a little bit more time on weaknesses. Um, I'll uh, also spend some time uh, uh, discussing our ideas for uh, solving the weaknesses, um, including uh, dealing with false positives, um, and go over the uh, new warnings I've been developing for GCC 11 to close uh, some of the gaps in coverage. If there is time uh, at the end, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to also share some of my thoughts on the uh, overlap between the uh, middle end warnings and uh, uh, those in the new static analyzer. Um, so while preparing for this talk, I went through uh, GCC source code uh, for the last three or so releases to uh, uh, get a better understanding of the scope of what I'll be talking about today. Um, and I found the numbers surprisingly high. Uh, they gave me a little bit of an idea of the, the trends uh, in warnings in general and uh, uh, the trends in the middle end in particular. Uh, the uh, numbers in parentheses give the uh, numbers of warning options uh, in previous releases, the uh, main number is the uh, uh, number of uh, uh, warnings in, on trunk, and I think it hasn't really changed in, uh, since GCC 10. Um, I'll be talking about, in this talk, uh, about a subset of the uh, 78 middle end uh, warning options. Uh, for those not familiar with uh, GCC architecture, the middle end warnings are those that uh, uh, are emitted um, during the uh, language and target independent stage of translation. So that's uh, uh, after uh, the front end has finished parsing the translation unit um, and converted it to the intermediate representation before the, uh, the back end uh, has gotten it, uh, hands on it and, and start convert started converting it to uh, uh, the registered transfer language and uh, ultimately into the uh, final instruction for the target architecture. Um, so the, as I said, the uh, um, talk is about the subset, uh, the flow-based subset of the 78 middle end warning options um, that work with the uh, Gimbal SSA representation in GCC. They traverse multiple statements to control uh, track, uh, to track control, uh, control and uh, uh, data flow. Um, some of them run in dedicated passes. Um, others run just before expansion to uh, the register transfer language uh, and, uh, the implement, and they're implementing the uh, built-ins.c and calls.c files. I also put together a partial listing of the middle end warnings, uh, some of which I'll be talking about to give you an idea of the specific uh, warning options that control them. Um, I took a, a, a a little bit of time to uh, try to come up with numbers of lines of code that uh, uh, each of the warnings is implemented in. Um, they, uh, the, the numbers um, only hint at the complexity of the warnings. Uh, it's, a, it's a rough and in some cases uh, inaccurate uh, approximation because some of the warnings depend on a lot of uh, other work done by the optimizer for uh, code generation. Nevertheless, they give us uh, a little bit of insight into um, what it takes to implement some of these warnings. Uh, the specific set of warnings I'd like to talk about today are the uh, access-based subset of the middle end warnings, which are uh, the array bounds warnings, uh, format overflow and truncation, which are uh, focused on bugs in uh, uh, calls to the SPRINF family of functions. Uh, restrict warning, which focuses on uh, uh, restrict violations in calls to uh, functions with restrict qualified pointers, uh, and in particular the uh, uh, built-ins with such pointers, such as memcopy, stircopy. Uh, string op overflow and truncation warnings, which focus on uh, accesses uh, by string manipulation functions, such as stircopy and memcopy, also um, uninitialized warnings, the non-null warning, um, which uh, detects invalid <coughs> accesses 
uh, to null pointers and functions declared with attribute not null and uh, the null dereference warning, which uh, tries to detect accesses to uh, uh, null, point, uh, null pointers. The uh, implementation strategy uh, shared by most flow-based access warnings is essentially the same. Uh, they traverse the intermediate language for uh, each function um, and for each interesting access statement, uh, they traverse the intermediate language back looking for the target of the access statement. The target could be either a declaration of an object or an allocation call. Um, along the way to the target, they determine the cumulative offset. Um, the offset is determined from uh, pointer arithmetic expressions uh, when a pointer, for example, is being added or subtracted. Um, when, once the algorithm arrives at the uh, target of the axis, it determines the size of the target. And then based on the size of the target and the offset and also the size of the axis, uh, the uh, warning either triggers uh, or doesn't trigger, uh, depending on whether or not the offset is out of bounds, um, the, the initial offset and the ending offset is out of bounds uh, for the size um, of the target of the axis, this is in the case of the overflow warnings, or if the axis over, overlaps with the other object, and this is for the restrict type of warning. <clears throat> the uh, um, interesting statements or expressions that these warnings look at are uh, array indexing, the array ref node and memref nodes in the uh, IL representation. Uh, they look for assignments to and from character types, um, which would be for the string op overflow types of warnings. Uh, they also look at calls to uh, string and memory built-in functions like memcopy and strcopy. Um, and they look at uh, calls to annotated user defined functions uh, annotated with the uh, access attribute. Um, so I'd like to spend a little bit of time on the strengths of the uh, uh, current warnings. The current implementation um, is, uh, uh, has been, uh, of many of the warnings, has been in place uh, for a good amount of time. Uh, WRA bounds, for example, has existed for at least 13 years. Um, but they have been improving in coverage uh, steadily in the last, in the recent releases. And um, so this, these improvements in coverage are uh, fairly easy to miss unless you, you've had the fortune or misfortune uh, to trigger one of these warnings. So I want to spend a little bit of time highlighting um, some of these more or less hidden strengths. Uh, the, uh, as I already mentioned, the uh, warnings perform an analysis of entire function bodies, uh, which include inline functions. Um, they provide uh, basic support for cross-functional analysis, although that's still in uh, very early stages. Uh, they implement bounce checking uh, and buffer overflow coverage for uh, both declared and dynamically allocated objects. Um, that includes calls to allica, uh, declarations of variably length arrays, uh, the malloc family of functions, C++ operator new, um, as well as functions declared with uh, attribute alloc size. They handle member objects, member sub-objects, and complete objects, um, as well as arrays of arrays. So they distinguish the uh, individual uh, element, array element boundaries. Uh, they provide handling for zero length arrays, uh, interior zero, zero length arrays in particular, uh, and flexible array members. Uh, and they support uh, ranges for both offsets and for uh, dynamically allocated objects, um, also ranges um, of sizes. <clears throat> Here's an example showing what I mean by support for ranges and allocated objects. The function uh, sets up, takes two arguments and sets up ranges for the two arguments um, and is used as the uh, size of the variable length array and is at most uh, three. Uh, the array has at most four elements. Um, and the index i uh, is used to access uh, an element of that array and its range is um, at least four. So the uh, example shows that the, the warning correctly triggers for this out of bounds access. Um, I uh, mentioned 
uh, support for cross-functional analysis among the strengths. And uh, it, I realize that means different things, very different things to different people. So I want to clarify what specifically I mean by it. Uh, the, uh, the, the support, as I already said, is, is very limited. Um, and even though I have access, uh, I have ideas for uh, uh, enhancing it in the future, the uh, uh, access analysis that's present in GCC uh, essentially consists only of uh, uh, an attribute. The attribute uh, is called access, um, and it in GCC 10 uh, lets the user to explicitly annotate a function with the form of the access, either write or, or read uh, only or read write. Um, that's performed by the function and associate the uh, uh, arguments um, uh, passed to the function, the pointer argument, with the size of the array the pointer points to. Um, in GCC 11, uh, there is an enhancement that's currently under review that allows uh, the, uh, the front end to uh, uh, implicitly apply the attribute to functions that either take uh, variable length array as arguments, that would be the second init function um, in C or in C++ uh, arrays of known bounds and turn those um, into the implicit uh, access attribute. And these uh, either explicit or implicit access attributes are then used by uh, the middle end uh, by the implementation of the warnings below to uh, uh, validate accesses both at the call sites uh, to those functions as well as in the bodies of those functions themselves. Uh, now for weaknesses. I, I think more interesting than uh, their strengths are the weaknesses of the middle end warnings um, because they are opportunities for improvements um, that I'm excited about. And I'm, I'm in particular excited about being able to find existing and prevent uh, new bugs from being introduced. Uh, we, we all make mistakes. Um, I feel like I make more mistakes than, than most. And uh, the compiler, I think, is in the ideal position to uh, help us catch at least the most obvious mistakes uh, before they embarrass us in uh, public code review, but uh, even worse, before they uh, cause harm if they are allowed to make it um, into the code base unnoticed. So in the uh, in this section on, on weaknesses, I'd like to uh, uh, spend some time uh, going over the uh, some of the reasons um, for um, the uh, uh, false negatives uh, behind some of these warnings, um, as well as discuss some false positives. Um, I'd like to uh, describe some of the uh, the reasons. Um, uh, some of the inconsistent approaches that are among those reasons and uh, discuss maybe uh, the missing coverage uh, that provides an opportunity for detecting more problems than we currently can. Um, so starting with false negatives, uh, there are a number of reasons why, uh, why the existing warnings don't, don't trigger. Uh, the uh, implementation of, of the warnings um, is diverse and inconsistent uh, from one morning to the next, and there is little code sharing. So that obviously presents a problem. Uh, same issue, uh, same enhancement has to be implemented multiple times, the same bug has to be uh, fixed in multiple places, and you have to know to fix it uh, to, uh, to, to take care of it. Um, one common weakness uh, is missing support for multiple objects, missing support for fee notes in the GCC internal representation. Um, another common reason for false negatives is uh, that the warnings make overly conservative decisions. And the, the overly conservative decisions are the result of uh, the warnings depending on uh, some of the, a lot of the work done by optimizers uh, and some of the data produced by the optimizers, which have to be conservative uh, in order not to introduce code generation bugs. But the conservative decisions aren't necessarily the best decisions uh, for warnings. Um, sometimes these, this, these decisions behind the false negatives are to accommodate hacks and uh, low-level system code uh, that most cleanly written uh, modern code um, uh, it doesn't, doesn't need um, and, and that would essentially represent bugs in uh, modern code. Um, 
even though the warnings take advantage of the uh, value uh, range information made available by uh, the uh, the VRP pass, the uh, uh, range information isn't necessarily always available or isn't of the quality to uh, uh, be able to do, uh, to uh, to issue uh, all warnings. And in some cases, the support is limited. Um, the support in the warnings is limited. We're hoping that the former. Uh, will be improved by the range of project that uh, Aldi and Andrew talked about earlier in the week. There is no support for symbolic ranges uh, in the current implementation of the warnings. Um, I'm not sure if Ranger will provide that support. Um, if yes, we will modify the warnings to take advantage of it, of course. Um, there is no support for definite loops, those with uh, known numbers, finite numbers of iterations. Um, some of the optimization decisions, in particular premature folding, um, are also behind uh, some false positives among the warnings. For example, folding or transforming stir copy calls to mem copy or mem copy calls to memref, the, the memref representation are behind some false positives. Um, folding past the n axis is the constant erase uh, to zero is also the reason why uh, some uh, invalid accesses are not diagnosed later on by the warning passes. I mentioned uh, a cross-functional anal analysis among the strengths, but I also said that it was very limited. So the limited uh, capabilities of the uh, analysis are also among the, uh, the reasons why uh, we miss uh, some opportunities to issue warnings. And finally, a poor uh, or limited L integration into LTO or with LTO um, is behind um, that some false negatives, some warnings are not enabled. Um, <clears throat> let me give some examples to make this concrete when I'm talking about uh, with the multiple objects, for, for instance, the fee notes not being handled. Here's a function uh, that defines two arrays, uh, both of the same size. Uh, the function takes two arguments. One is an index that it sets up a range for, again, uh, from four to uh, unsigned in max. Uh, it takes a condition. The condition is then used to uh, define a pointer uh, to point to one of the two objects, and then the pointer is used to access uh, either one of the two objects uh, beyond their boundaries past their end. This is not diagnosed as a result of the uh, lack of support for fee nodes. Um, the, uh, implementing the support isn't necessarily terribly difficult, um, but there are some open questions, in particular how to handle cases where only one of the two objects um, is too small for the axis. Um, should we provide uh, a maybe array bounds type of an option, a maybe string overflow type of an option? In other words, should we duplicate the number of all the axis options uh, to accommodate the maybe situation? Uh, that doesn't seem very appealing from an implementation point of view, uh, maybe not even from a user point of view. Uh, should we introduce new levels? That's, a, that's an option to consider. At the same time, both of these warnings I mentioned above already have uh, levels, so it's unclear uh, at this point how, uh, how that should be resolved. We need to resolve these questions first before we uh, address this weakness. Um, here's an example of, uh, of a false negative as a result of the permissiveness built in uh, to GCC for a special low-level system code. Uh, first of all, GCC, uh, for optimization purposes, treats uh, trailing arrays of essentially any size in most situations, although not in all situations, as flexible array members. Um, GCC also uh, uh, treats memcopy as special, and uh, uh, in its implementation of fortify source or object size checking uh, doesn't consider member boundaries when dealing with memcopy calls. But as I mentioned earlier, stir copy calls are also lower to mem copy in some cases, in particular with uh, uh, constant arguments. So in conjunction, these three um, feature, if you will, conspire to uh, prevent uh, the warnings from triggering for an example on this slide where we have a stir copy call writing a constant string into the first array of eight elements, I think the string has about 18 characters or so. So obviously it, it overwrites not just the uh, name member, but also the password member and writes beyond the, uh, the next memory. This is not detected as a result of, uh, of these three transformations. Um, incomplete range, range support, again, to be clear what I mean by uh, one aspect of the incomplete support is 
the warning's inability to uh, fully take advantage of the value range information in this case. So the uh, example on the slide shows a function that takes a sign argument, um, which it then passes to, uh, to malloc. Uh, the conversions from signed to unsigned integers result in anti-ranges, and anti-ranges tend to be tricky to work with. They're essentially the union of two uh, ordinary ranges. Um, they're prone to bugs, and uh, for, for the most part, they're not really handled um, by the warnings. So uh, the result um, is a false negative in this case, where the strict copy call doesn't uh, trigger a false, uh, it doesn't trigger a, uh, a buffer overflow warning. Uh, poor support for definite loops. Here we have another, another example where the loop uh, performs an out of bounds um, access to the, uh, to the trailing member, and that's not detected, even though it is detected in the uh, roughly equivalent function f above uh, by the array bounds warning. Um, false positives. Um, Besides making real problem, missing real problems, I should say, um, most warnings also suffer from some sort of false alarms. And that's true for warnings regardless where they're implemented, uh, either the front end or the back end. Uh, the, in the front end, the false positives uh, are almost, almost always due to bugs and can be fairly easily fixed. Um, but in flow-based warnings, a zero rate of uh, false positives is simply not attainable. Uh, so it's important to understand that they are to be expected. Um, and GCC makes this clear by defining warnings as, and I quote, diagnostic messages that report constructions that are not inherently erroneous, but that are risky, or suggest there may have been an error. And some warnings even make it explicit by using uh, words like maybe uninitialized, maybe used uninitialized, may overflow, and so on, uh, when they can't prove that the, uh, the problem is certain to occur. So with all that being said, the more susceptible warnings, uh, the more susceptible warning is uh, to these false alarms, the less useful it is. And it's important to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, make every effort to keep the false positives to a minimum. So I, uh, in the remaining two and a half minutes, I'd like to uh, go over some of the uh, uh, reasons for uh, false positives in the uh, GCC uh, warnings. Here's an example where the redundancy elimination pass gets in the way of preventing a false positive. Um, here we have uh, a union uh, with two members, uh, their arrays, one smaller, one bigger. The arrays are being passed to a functions that expect larger array and, and a smaller array of the corresponding size. Uh, it's a correct example um, that shouldn't trigger any warnings. The redundancy elimination pass then goes ahead and determines that uh, the two arrays, because they're members of a union, both reside at the same address, the same offsets, and uh, replaces one with the other. The result of the uh, uh, elimination pass is then uh, this intermediate language, which has the, uh, uh, the two functions both accessing the smaller of the two arrays. And that triggers the uh, string op overflow warning um, because it focuses on the uh, array that it's presented in the intermediate language. Um, another example is loop unrolling. Here we have a, a, a small uh, small test case that uh, was reduced from a larger one that was uh, where the bounds uh, and sizes of arrays were obscured behind macros. Um, so the example was a less contrived, uh, or the original test case was less contrived than this example. But it's a safe example that iterates over the over uh, the single element of an array, calling memset followed by storing uh, an, a value in an element of the array. Again, safe, correct, no problem. The loop unroller decides to unroll the loop. It uses the uh, uh, access to the uh, uh, the store to that uh, member X um, in the second iteration array to decide that the loop iterates exactly once. Um, the second uh, iteration of the loop is also unrolled. The access, the invalid access, is replaced by a call to built-in unreachable, uh, but the memset call remains in the intermediate language. The memset call, again, is the uh, uh, target of one of the warnings. Um, and uh, a false positive triggers here in this case. Um, there is a, a, another reason for false positives and negatives, and that's the inconsistent approaches among the warnings. Uh, they all implement essentially the same uh, algorithms, but uh, they are implemented independently of, of one another. They share very little code, uh, implemented in different passes, and that results in duplication code and effort and bugs. 
uh, an intricate interaction between uh, uh, the warnings. Uh, there's also a missing coverage, um, but it looks like time is up and I don't have time to go into that. If, if you have questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to me either uh, uh, at the email address at the end of the slides or uh, on the GCC help mailing list. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, uh, um, and thank you very much for keeping us time. Much appreciated. And we have a couple of minutes while we're just waiting for our final talk of this year's uh, GNU Tools track. But I would give an advanced advert advertisement that there is a micro conference tomorrow specifically looking at the uh, uh, GNU tools as they apply to the kernel. So the GNU toolchain uh, microconference. If you're attending uh, this meeting, you're t you're you're also able to attend that meeting, um, uh, which is organised by uh, uh, God knows organising it now. Uh, I think Jose Marquezi, uh, Jose Marquezi. Thank you. Okay, I can see you well, that's good. Can you hear me? Yes, very clear. Yeah, we have two and a half minutes and then we'll start. Thank you. Is there a way to move this? To go to the next slide. Uh, you, there should be a little at the bottom of your slide. There should be a little right, right arrow and left arrow. Oh, uh, let me. Uh, no. Oh, yes, I see that. Okay, thank you. Okay, all yours. Oh, okay, okay, so that's 30. Uh, this is the update I gave uh, in RPC 2018 about the uh, lin enable CET in Linux. So, brief introduction CET are two parts. Uh, shadow stack and IBT. I will go this uh, very fast. 
And I will skip the description. I assume everybody here is uh, familiar with what it does. And also, I will skip this part, basically, it's how to manage the shadow stack. It's the same as I did two years ago. And uh, this particular one, I want to talk about this because uh, this uh, will be uh, has to be implemented in all the programs which skip stack frame for whatever reason. And so there are two ways to skip stack frames. So if you know how many stack frames you want to skip, we have instructions. You can increment the uh, shadow stack pointer. Or you, if you do not know how many stack frames you want, you need to skip. You can compare the top of the normal stack that should contain the return address against the top of the shadow stack, which only contain the return address. So you pop the shadow stack one frame at a time until they match. So that's how you adjust the shadow stack when you return. If the is a, if some if uh, stack frames are skipped. Next slide. So indirect branch tracking is not very interesting. This is a difference uh, from the uh, last talk I gave two years ago. In the CET processors support the, uh, the optional legacy bin map. That is one bit in the bin map represent the page. If the bit is set, the uh, indirect branch tracking will be disabled. It is supposed to allow you to load the legacy uh, programs and put them into the legacy bin map you can still enable the uh, IBT in the rest of the program. And while enabled CET on Linux OS, we discovered the optional legacy bitmap does not work for JIT. So if you have a shared library, as a legacy shared library contained with JIT, and the loader can put the legacy share library in the legacy bitmap. But when the jet engine inside the legacy share library, allocate the page, generate the code, that's a legacy code, but it's not covered by legacy bitmap. So you've got a crash when the jet code are executed. So the solution is we remove the legacy bitmap support on Linux. We, so IBT is either you have IBT or you don't. You do not have a portion of the program with IBT disabled. Just like shadow step, no difference. Uh, so, the CET, so by design, you, are, you can only enable CET in your process if the, all the components are enabled with CET. So we did that, uh, starting from kernel, toolchain libraries, and uh, piece by piece. So the thing is, we do that piece by piece, not in one shot. And we started effort more than two years ago. We are getting there. And also the CET in Nipple OS is backward compatible. That means the same CET in Nipple OS, by the way, can run on both CET and legacy processors. Of course, we do not get security protection on legacy processors, but we do not see performance loss on legacy processors either. That's the key part. The uh, CET runtime. So, what on the CET enabled OS on a CET processor, and the 
all every application is in loaded with CT enabled if the program itself is not is CT enabled. And uh, for the static executable kernel loader is responsible to disable CET or not enable it when the uh, loading a legacy static executable. For the dynamic one, dynamic loader is, of course, is CET enabled. So the, the kernel will start the loader with CET enabled. So the loader will check if there are any legacy share libraries or executables. Uh, loader will disable CET if any components are not CET enabled. And also the loader will issue an error when you try to DR open the legacy share library from the CET enabled process. And that's one change from last, last uh, from two years ago. So we added, uh, in GDPC, we added a config time option to change the loader behavior. And that by that I mean, it will change the DR open, basically. So if the CT is enabled permissively, and the loader will disable CT while loading the legacy share library. And we also have some runtime control to do that on a per process basis. CT to chain. So GCC is uh, enabled uh, from since GCC 8. And the linker also enabled. And uh, we did. So we put the marker in the uh, in the object uh, linker. Also, make sure we have a CT compatible PLT entry, and we have a GCC provider header file for assembly code, and we did that for C, C plus plus and Fortran. While for the well, for the, over the last two years, while we enable CET on applications, and sometimes the linker by default will disable CET if any linker inputs are not CET enabled. But sometimes you want to know why linker does that. By I mean that uh, will disable CET. And uh, there's a linker switch you can pass to the linker to identify the input objects with a missing CT marker. And also, we discovered there are some tools, specifically NASM and WEDM, that no way you can generate a CT marker. And uh, so there is a linker option you can do to add the CT marker to a real relocatable object. So that's very handy in some packages because they only they can only be assembled with the NADM or them. Oh, our, so the wind change from our for our VM from compared with two years ago. So finally, our CET is functional in our VM eleven. There are some there are some uh, backports for our VM ten dot x. Uh, everything except for the uh, CET dot h CET dot h header file is only available in our VM eleven. And uh, however, that one exception, lib online, is not CT enabled. And there is a link on my slide to the uh, RBM bug report. For 
Enable CET in application is very straightforward, especially if you have C and C++ in the Fortran, just compile with the CI protection you are done. Uh, for JET, and of course you have put the end branch and the interval branch targets. Also you have to adjust shadow stack when stack frames are skipped. So uh, there are a couple JETs have been CT enabled. And one of them is uh, SL JET. It is used by Git. That's how I, how, how I found out uh, why I need to enable the, uh, the CET in SL JET. And uh, as I mentioned before, RVM JET has been CET enabled. And there's a JET in the uh, Mesa graphics driver is CET enabled. And for the uh, assembly code, you have to put the end branch and the all potential in the direct branch target by hand. And you have, a, you have to mark all assembly code as CET enabled by adding a marker. And if you have an assembly code pre processed by the GCC, you can just include DSCT.h and compile with a dash F CF protection, and marker will be added for you. In other high level language, are not CT enabled yet. So, for a status, uh, GCC 8, Builder 2033, GDPC 2032, and also CT backport available for GDC 2030 and 31. Actually, I have done that for 2028. And Fedora 33 and the Ubuntu 2010 are two of the CT enabled OSs. Uh, the key thing is there's no performance impact on legacy processor. And the, how many people are using Fedora and Ubuntu. And you may not notice, and the Fedora 30, Fedora 28, I think, maybe 27, 28, uh, let's just say 28, is first the uh, Fedora has pieces of the CET enabled components. And uh, I think Fedora 33 and 20, on Ubuntu 2010, I would say 90 to 95 percent of the uh, packages had been CT enabled. Then, and I'm not aware any people are complaining performance issues on uh, uh, legacy processors. So that's a good sign. So the kernel status. Probably we that's not probably they are kind of out of date. I want to spend a little more time on this a little bit. Uh, they are for the CT kernel upstream, we are targeting I think 5.10. And in the meantime, and I'm also maintaining the uh, stable kernel. And the current version, this is this slide little bit of date. And the current CET current stable CET kernel is 5.8, not 7. Uh, because CET kernel patches have not been upstream yet, there are, are going to be changes uh, in the uh, Cisco interface for CT uh, enabling. Uh, I have a plan to address this issue. So as soon as the CT patches are upstreamed, I'm going to uh, submit a corresponding GDPC patches to update the CT support to the upstream kernel. And I'm, I'm also going to backport to the GDPC 2.28. Okay, okay, I think I'm... There is 
a CT smoke test. So we have uh, some CT smoke test based. It, those are check the basic CT functionality on a CT enabled platform. They are quick tests. They are just to see if every basic thing works correctly. They are also violation tests. So those tests introduce the uh, CET violation, both for shadow stack and, and for IBT. And those tests will run on legacy processors, but they should fail with the SEC for the um, CET enabled platform. So that is very handy. Uh, they are current also have some self test. And the difference between the CT smoke test and the kernel self test is the CT smoke test is only intended to run on CT enabled platform and it verify if CT is functional or not on a CT enabled uh, platform. And kernel self test just run on both CT and non CT platforms and it verifies CT not broken. It does not verify CT is functional at all. So that's the difference. Ah, so I think that's I think that's the main reason I gave this presentation. It's call to action, and the Tiger Lake launch is just around the corner, and. Uh, very, very soon. So people can get targeted to see how CET works. You can use either Fedora 33 or uh, Ubuntu 2010. And as I said, CET is enabled about 95% of main OS, they are still 5%. In the 5% I'm only talking about the percentage of software is not, it's not the representative of the usage. The usage can be more than 5%. The, uh, I will answer the question, we will answer the question after this. Uh, so uh, there are some other high level language like Rust and Go, I would like to see a CT enabled and the brothers like Chrome, and Firefox, and Java, and like OpenJDK. And I hope Fedora 33 and Ubuntu 2010 will give a, a platform for the community, for little community to, to see how CET works on Hagerly and also to enable CET in the rest of the 5% of Linux OS. I think that's the end of my talk. I will try to answer all the questions and uh, I have. So, uh, okay, the first one, how do we test the CET uh, without, uh, without uh, CET hardware? I think the best way to do that, as I said, get the Tiger Lake. They will be available very, very soon. And without Tiger Lake, there is SDE. Uh, I haven't tried that for a long time. So you can give it in SD a try to see if that works for your purpose. But I highly recommend you get Tiger Lake. Tiger Lake is uh, at least from my review on the internet, the performance should be pretty good. And it has CET support. And for the CET marker, uh, so the uh, we have been, the tool chain has been generating CET markers for more than two years and the kernel patches are, uh, under, they understand the CET marker. So, and they are so the CET marker five minutes fade is not up it's not an uh, opcode. It's it's just uh, a special note, special um, elf note 
and it indicates if the object is it need or not. Uh, is any testing to see? Uh, for the key work with key probe, I do not know. Uh, we the the marker is not at yeah the marker is at an object level and the linker can merge them and yeah so if there are i think that all the questions i have that thing so far if if there are any other questions you can always uh, email me offline and I will happy to answer all, any questions. And uh, I guess there are still no other questions. A request just appeared. Could you compare uh, PX wrap versus CET? Uh, are we talking about the uh, the ARM equivalent version, something or different? Is this, I'm not familiar what the pack and wrap is. Alexander, would you like to join the uh, audio and speak? It's from which processor vendor? I think it's uh, software only emulation. Oh, yeah. software. It's, I mean. So, so it's like a stack protector, but different. It's. I heard the uh, uh, shadow software shadow stack. I'm not sure if the same thing or not. So, so I'm not familiar with that. So it, if it is a software shadow stack, I have I have some comments, three minutes. So you can do not believe well well what well, can be done can emulate CET but to emulate CET it is not only you have to emulate the opcode you have to emulate the Cisco that is what SDE does so SDE emulate Cisco so to 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 but only work with particular interface How secure we can get for with CT when full OS CT enabled? That's a good question. And I think time will tell. Of course, the, 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 the intention is to prevent ROP and GOP. All right. Do you plan to add flag checking so that? Uh, critical functions like system and exec VE and glibc are only uh, enabled if there's an actual symbol reference in the process image to them. Because until we do that, you, a shell code can still jump to the system function and because it has an end branch marker, it's going to pass the uh, um the, the CET check and you then proceed to execute the, the shell code in, in in the function argument. Yeah, so this IBT only prevent you jump to an arbitrary uh location because X86 can execute from any particular offset. So the IBT will prevent you from doing that. 
but will not prevent you from jump to a valid indirect branch target. As for if is that uh, uh, that if if it, how can it's not so that's a I would say it's a different uh, uh, feature with or without seed uh, without with or without IBT. If uh, in in if a particular in branch target is a valid option. If if this uh, the the valid target or not, I think like. If give a function pointer, it give a wrong function. You send the function to a wrong, wrong function, so CET will not help you there. I'm I'm not sure if that's uh, what you. Okay. We can continue this. I think one. we have to. I think we have to draw to a close there. Thank you very much uh, for that talk. Um, uh, so um, I, uh, that brings us to the end of the first ever full GNU tools track at uh, Linux Plumbers. Um, I would like to um, uh, 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 thank all those who've made it possible. Um, I'd like to uh, thank uh, uh, Eleanor for all she's done from the Linux Plumbers conference to make the job much easier in very difficult circumstances. First time they've ever run a virtual conference at all. I'd like to thank all those who've moderated and acted on the program committee, Simon March, Joel Brobecker, Frank Eigler, Jose Marchese, David Edelson, Ulrich Wiegand, Weigand. And lastly, uh, but not least, I'd like to thank Sarah Cook for uh, her sterling work in the background with popping up those slides and saying one minute, five minute, three minute, time's up. Thank you to all those who've supported us over the years. Thank you to LPC for stepping in and uh, all being well, I'm sure many of us will be at LPC next year in the flesh, but we'll have Cauldron back as well in some form, we hope, next year. Um, for those of you who are sticking around, tomorrow there will be the Linux GNU Toolchain microconference. I hope possibly some of you will be there, but if not, I look forward to seeing you at next year's event. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>